This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices. Um, well, I want to start by thanking everyone for joining me and everyone here today and um, on what is a beautiful day here in the Northeast anyway. I see we have uh, at least somewhat of an international crowd. I think I saw Andrew here from England, so um, I don't know who else might be here. But um, I am David Hill, the archivist and librarian at the American Numismatic Society, so welcome to this Money Talks. I'm calling this talk From Acorn to Sapling. And this is because almost from the very beginning, the American Numismatic Society has taken as its symbol the mighty oak arising from the humble acorn, as you can see here on our um, first and also the current members' medals. So eventually the ANS would put down strong roots and become a solid research institution and the learned society that we know today. But here we're mostly going to look back at the society, society's earlier decades. So this is, would be its sapling years. Okay, uh, the early history of the ANS can conveniently be divided into pre-Archer Huntington and post-Archer Huntington eras. And so I wanna take a moment to look at the post-Huntington era to see, you know, to kind of contrast it with the 19th century. Um, so Huntington was a wealthy railroad heir who became the society's president in 1905. His wealth brought st stability to the society and allowed it to achieve goals that had eluded it in the past. Early in life, he developed an obsession with medieval and modern Spain, and he's seen here on his first trip to Spain in 1892, so I guess that would make him about 22 years old at the time. Eventually, he'd build a large collection of books and paintings and coins, anything really relating to the Iberian Peninsula and its offshoots. He had no formal advanced education, but that's not to say that he was uneducated. So while he did turn down an opportunity to study at Yale, his father, for example, would do things like hire a Yale professor to accompany him on these trips, like when he went to Spain. He was proficient in Castilian, and he translated and published the epic poem El Cid in a three-volume set in 1897. Uh, his impulses were decidedly scholarly, and he would push the society in that direction. Huntington built the Hispanic Society of America as a museum to house his growing collections, and he donated the land and money to complete a building to house the ANS. So you can see the ANS original building there on the right. Uh, I believe the first meeting they got in there for the 50th anniversary. So it was, I think they held the first meeting in 1908 uh, and the Hispanic Society was built in, I think it was completed in 1905. He donated the land and the money to uh, complete the building and to house the ANS. And he also funded other institutions that moved into the complex, what, what was called Audubon Terrace in Manhattan's far upper west side. Other uh, institutions occupied the um, a complex up there, and such as the Museum of the American Indian and uh, the American Academy of Arts and Letters. His wife, uh, it was his second wife, the noted sculptor Anna Hyatt, uh, who he married in 1923, contributed sculptures to this complex. And I, th I find Anna Hunty, I mean, this is kind of a digression here, but she's a fascinating character. And one thing I find interesting about her is her longevity. I mean, she lived to be 97. And I wrote an article about her, and it was interesting to me. She was certainly um, quite um, successful uh, very early on, certainly before she met Archer Huntington. And um, I say, I, I, in this article I wrote, I said something like she was successful by the time of the first uh, Wright Brothers flight. And then she also... Um, she lived to see men walk on the moon. So she, and she was active all during that time. So she was very successful. And she, she married Archer Huntington. Um, I think she was in her forties by that time. And then they had a great life together. They, uh, you know, as you, many of you well know, they founded a Brook Green in, uh, in South Carolina and a sculpture garden, basically. They, some old estates there that they took over and they, they would travel back and forth. They redid a, um, I think they redid a truck and turned it into a trailer or something like this and they would go back and forth and they had a 
house in upstate New York where they had a lot of animals. She was known for doing these animals uh, in her sculptures. That was what she was known for early on. And here she's, you see her sculpting here, Joan of Arc. So um, there's a great Joan of Arc statue that she did that's at 93rd Street on the west side of Manhattan. And it's also, there's uh, other uh, versions of it in um, Paris and also Canada, I think. And um, New Orleans, I, I believe. Um, anyway, that's a big digression, uh, but I, I find her to be a very interesting character. Okay, so with this new building, the ANS finally had a place to mount exhibits, which were always been quite successful. So I mentioned Joan of Arc. They had a big Joan of Arc exhibit here in 1913, and this reportedly brought nearly, I mean, you get, sometimes you got to wonder about these claims. This, the, the, I think it is, I found this in the proceedings of the ANS, could have been in the New York Times, but they, so supposedly 9,000 people went to go see this thing at Audubon Terrace. So anyway, they did have a building finally where they could uh, display things and this sort of thing. The INS would eventually start calling itself, using the word museum to describe itself. The INS continued to grow, and in 1929, an addition was added to the original building. And this was also paid for by Huntington. And this is more or less what it looks like today. And the INS moved out of here in 2004. So this is basically what it looked like after all these buildings have been combined, and you have all these other various institutions up there. Huntington also funded the first professional staff and the first salaried curator hired was Agnes Baldwin Brett in 1909. She was a Greek and Roman specialist and you can see uh, her here uh, with a group from the American School of Athens in Greece. Huntington is considered advanced in his thinking because he subscribed to the idea that curators should become specialists in the objects that they cared for, rather than the idea at the time was that you would mostly cater to visitors. This was a notion that apparently that came out of Germany, this idea of being specialized in what you did. Um, he also felt that women were especially suited to this kind of work, and he specifically called it, quote, women's work, but he, he meant this as a compliment, I think. Uh, from the start, the Hispanic Society regularly hired women as curators and librarians. And in this post-Huntington period, Huntington also funded a monograph series in 1920, Numismatic Notes and Monographs, specifically to publish original scholarship rather than popular subjects. And to this day, the ANS is a major publisher of scholarly numismatic works. Um, this was a record year, actually. Andrew Reinhardt in the publications office at the ANS has been doing a great job, and I don't know how he makes his way through all of these books, frankly, because some of them are real doorstops, like, uh, um, you know, White Gold that came out this year. It's just a huge thing. So I think they're publishing in the last uh, uh, fiscal year eight books, and then I know four more are coming. So it's really just an amazing job that he's been doing, and everybody's been doing, authors and uh, Oliver Hoover and all, all the people that work on those things. Huntington would be joined in his efforts to push the ANS in a more scholarly direction by another independently wealthy member and president, Ed Edward Newell, who joined the ANS the year that Huntington became president, 1905. Newell did have degrees from Yale and an inheritance from a wagon manufacturing fortune that gave him the time and means to spend on coin hunting excursions. Uh, traveling from Egypt to Italy. And we have actually great uh, correspondence from him during this time where he kind of describes his uh, jaunts going to all of these different places and visiting all of these coin cabinets. It's actually very interesting stuff. He developed an expertise on the coins of Alexander the Great and his successors and published prolifically, starting with his groundbreaking reattributions of Alexandrian coinage published in the Society's American Journal of Numismatics. His eventual bequest of some 87,000 Greek and Near Eastern coins, uh, they formed the core of the society's holdings in these areas. You can see examples over here, but not only do we have correspondence from Newell, but we have these notebooks um, that are just filled with all kinds of great information, and many of them you can find online. So a lot of these have been scanned. So over 40 of these have been scanned and are available online through the ANS's archives database, Archer. Uh, some of which have these interactive links um, paid for by a recent grant. A lot of work has gone into this where you can actually link from these pages out to examples of coins described in these. And this is going to be an ongoing project of uh, annotating these. Okay, so having looked at the post-Huntington era, 
what the ANS would eventually become, I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning of the ANS. We have in the archives one of the original invitations dated March 8th, 1858, that was sent out on a behalf of a group of men looking to form an antiquarian society. Uh, very soon they would describe this as a coin collector's group. But they use, the word they used at first is just antiquarian society. This um, invitation came to us later by uh, someone we'll meet in just a moment, um, Edward Grow. The INS looks to Augustus Sage almost as its founder because these first meetings were held at his house. Well, actually it's sometimes referred to as his mother's house because he was just 16 years old at the time. And you see him here in his Civil War uniform. Uh, he was kind of sickly. Um, he, was, uh, he, he died in the, 19, the 1870s um, of pneumonia, I believe. So he lived to, to be 32. Um, he was just 16 years old when, he, uh, when the first meetings for the ANS uh, ha happened at his house. Um, though some of his informal writings on coins had already appeared in the popular press. These are the famous gleanings of coins columns that he signed as Gus that appeared in the New York Dispatch in 1857. And in these columns, Sage got into a rather testy, if you read these things, this is how it sounds to me, um, I don't know. Um, it sounds to me a rather testy back and forth with the correspondent calling himself numismatist, who actually comes off sounding quite obnoxious really in these, uh, in these kind of back and forth in these various columns. You know, Sage was 16, he barely, he barely 16, and he was writing these things that he knew about coins from, that he took from encyclopedias and was, this uh, numismatist would, you know, kind of lay, lay into him on this, uh, these, all these matters and he, very sarcastically. So anyway, he really gave him a hard time um, for his ignorance. Uh, and the writer turned out to be none other than the noted collector, Charles Ira Bushnell. Now, to me is interesting is because they sound so obnoxious to, I don't know, to the, my modern ear, perhaps. Uh, they became something of uh, mutual admirers uh, very quickly, um, became quite friendly. I mean, um, they're honoring each other here as, as early as the next year, 1858, I guess. Uh, Bush, Bushnell's tone was remarkably harsh and sarcastic, as I said, so um, this is, a, a, this is a, um, a, a medal, I guess, that was done by Bushnell um, honoring Sage in 1858. Uh, Bushnell had three of these made. One was given to the ANS by Sage, Another was given to the New York Dispatch and one that he kept for himself. Now we have the one from Sage. Um, I, I looked into this a little bit. I don't know, I, I, is this unique or there, supposedly there are three, but I, I didn't, um, you know, I haven't done a lot of research on this, but um, I didn't see anything indicating the other two. So somebody can probably help me out in the comments if they know about this. And this is the one where Sage honored Bushnell, making him uh, the first in Sage's numismatic gallery series. The next year. Now this is the location uh, where the meeting uh, took place at uh, Sage's house and you can see the arrow here indicating the address 121 Essex Street. So uh, Jim Dicewinner, I don't know if uh, he's with us today, but he's done some research on this building. This building was definitely he found built in the 1870s so this certainly was not where they were meeting. Um, he is here. <laughs> oh good, so you know Jim, we've talked about this quite a bit. So um, now, this is not the building where they met either, but looking at some map evidence and kind of looking around, this is a, a rare survivor for this part of New York City. I mean, for any part of New York City, really. Um, this is the Lower East Side, it's very near where uh, that took place, um, that meeting. Um, so this is on the Lower East Side, and um, I, I picture the house being very much like this from what I've seen in this kind of map evidence here. I see that it was, um, you know, kind of a, um, possibly a, uh, well, it's a brick or stone dwelling I have written down here. So, well, this is a brick building. So um, anyway, I think this is probably very much like the house where the ANS first met. Now I mentioned Grow before. The men who gathered at Sage's house, including the 20 year old Edward Grow, uh, were swept up in what was even at the time called a mania for coin collecting. I believe that comes out of the, um, the minutes of the Philadelphia Numismatic Society in 1865. I think they, they'd say, oh yeah, a few years ago, you remember the mania for coin collecting. I think that's basically what they say in kind of the opening to their proceedings. Um, so this was kind of acknowledged very much at the time because uh, as we'll see in a minute, these groups were all getting started and people were really getting into this coin collecting. 
uh, Grow, like Sage and others, we're interested in all kinds of coins generally. And you see this, these are from Grow, uh, it's Grow's notebooks. This is another, um, we have a bunch of these, man, I picture maybe seven of these uh, notebooks of Grow's with rubbings and all kinds of notes and stuff that Grow was doing in the 1850s and I think 1860s. Um, Grow, like Sage, um, they were interested in all kinds of coins generally, as I said, and um, what he and the others were really obsessive about were the patriotic and merchant tokens that served as substitute currency during uh, the times when small change was scarce, uh, such as what we know as the hard times tokens, the 1830s and 40s, and Civil War tokens. These guys were really into collecting these. Uh, 50 years later, in 1901, Grow would donate his collection of over 5,000 Civil War tokens to the NS. Uh, 1901, I think that is probably, yeah, must have been the largest donation of any number of uh, coins at the time. There's another person that's close to Jim Nicewinner's heart. Um, he's written about him in his books. Uh, Joseph Levick. It's never been much of a mystery what caused the sudden interest in coin collecting in 1850s. Even observers at the time, such as the coin dealer Edward Kogan, remarked that it had to do with the overhaul in US coinage that had taken place at the time. New coin types had replaced the old while uh, driving out various foreign coinage that had always circulated freely in the United States. The familiar large cents, as we see here, uh, issued since 1793 were discontinued and replaced by smaller cents, all of which led to an overall general interest and hoarding of coin types. So Levick here, uh, he was an important early member, um, very instrumental in starting the um, American Journal of Numismatics, for example, uh, published a dialing analysis of large cents in the 1860s in the AJN. Okay, so right around the same time as the ANS got started, two other societies were started in the U.S. in the two big cities on the East Coast. One in Philadelphia, which beat the ANS to the title of being first by just a couple of months. Uh, they got started in January of 1858, and the ANS got started a few months later in March and April. Um, and the other group in Boston in 1860. Both groups had similar beginnings to the ANS, but really ended up on different trajectories. Um, the Boston Numismatic Society was started in 1860 by eight men who got together at the New England Historical uh, Genealogical Society. And this is a bit misleading in this picture. This is the old state house of Boston, I believe. This is really just supposed to evoke that time. I think that um, I found a picture of Boston, the, the good picture of Boston in the 1860s, so I used it. but. It, this is not where they met, that, though that would be very convenient if it was. Uh, the group began holding monthly meetings and its coin cabinet and library grew steadily. Apparently it developed a reputation for being stodgy, aristocratic, and exclusive, which are characteristics said to be particularly prevalent in one of its founders and most active members for decades, the independently wealthy collector William Appleton. Its early membership would peak at 28 in 1865 and dwindled after that. Its paying membership fell to a low of four in the 1890s. And so in 1897, with prospects bleak, they turned over their remaining cash, numismatic collections, and books to the Museum of Fine Arts, um, got the collections, uh, numismatic collections, and the Boston Public Library got the library. Appleton died in 1904, and there was talk of dissolving, and no dues had been collected since 1897. However, there were, due to some efforts to kind of loosen things up, they kind of, they had had these strict rules about membership, but they decided to kind of look the other way on some of these, and new members were admitted, one of whom was Howland Wood, who would later come to the ANS in, I think, 1913, and he would be an ANS curator for 25 years. And so in Boston, monthly meetings were resumed. And thanks to this rebirth, the Boston Society soldiered on and is very much alive today, currently with 55 members. And it just had its, well, when I, when I last found out, and this is probably still true because of this COVID, uh, it's just celebrated or had its 1,485th meeting. 
I'd like to point out that the proceedings of the Boston Numismatic Society have now been, have been scanned for the Newman Numismatic Portal and are available online. These are the unpublished records of the group going right back to the very beginning in 1860. In Philadelphia, it was also eight men who got together to form their numismatic society with meetings held at various members' houses. Um, this is Independence Hall, so this is again not where this group first met, but it's just representative. Again, I think this is probably Philadelphia in the 1860s. In 1865, the word antiquarian was added to the name in an attempt, in an attempt to broaden its appeal. In fact, antiquarian or archaeological topics came to dominate their published proceedings. And of the 48 papers read before the society in 1892, from 1892 to 1898, only four were numismatic. So four out of 48. It's always kind of surprising. And I'm, it's my understanding that this is still, I've been told more of a uh, group uh, that is more uh, archeological than numismatic perhaps, but I, it's kind of a mystery to me. Um, by the end of the century, the group had about 200 members uh, compared to about 300 at the ANS. And like the Boston group, it would continue to operate more like a club, really, with its primary focus on meetings. Its coin and library collections were held on deposit at other institutions. I know that by the mid 20th century, it had a library of at least 8,000 items housed at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and a cabinet of about 11,000 coins and medals held at Memorial Hall in Fairmont Park under the auspices of what was then called the Pennsylvania Museum and School of Industrial Art. Um, be, beyond that though, this group has always been a bit of a mystery to me. I finally did get in touch. Uh, there are probably people here today listening that I have asked and told this to, but I, 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 very surprising to me, this group, I finally did confirm that it exists. I was finally put in touch with somebody that's a member of this group. And um, I just recently got some further contacts, but it, it, I was almost embarrassed to say, like, I can't find any information in this group. Uh, but then I started to ask around and I found that I wasn't the only one that could not provide any information on this group. So um, I, anybody that can, you know, knows anything about this group currently, or I, I'm still a little unclear of what happened to their collections and library and numismatic collections ultimately, um, please let me know. You can uh, email me at hill, H-I-L-L, -L, at numismatics.org um, or in the comments, or you can, you know, speak up after this. Um, this, this group, I, I, was, I was even talking to people in Pennsylvania and they were, they were kind of unsure uh, about it, but it certainly, it still exists. And um, I know that they're, they have meetings. This is a photograph on the right that I took of the house that belonging to um, Arthur Coffin, where the Philadelphia Society was formed in the 1850s. Um, I happened to be in Philadelphia, so I went over and took a picture of the house. Um, the one on the left there is from their proceedings in 1916. I don't know why I felt the need to put these two together, although it's kind of interesting. This certainly hasn't changed much um, since the picture on the left was taken. Um, the reason I was down there, this is back before the COVID shutdown, I went to the Philadelphia to examine the records of the Philadelphia Numismatic Society, which are held at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania which is a great place to visit. And the house that I just showed you, Coffin's house, is very close to there. It has a beautiful reading room. I mean, you don't see anybody here now, but it was really quite busy when I was there and it was a fantastic staff and everybody was very helpful. But it was a great opportunity to go down there. I'd work with the records of the American Numismatic Society all the time. And uh, the ones from the Boston Society are online, so I'm able to use those, but I had to go to Philadelphia to use these records. And it was really great to see them and kind of compare them to the records that we have at the ANS. Um, so they have things like the minutes and they have these books full of, um, of correspondence. And the other thing I must say for, for how much it seems to be an archeological society uh, in their papers and from what I'm hearing, um, these letters for the most part are very similar to the ones that we have at the ANS. You know, I have a coin, how much is it worth? This coin's very old, it must be very expensive, it must be very much worth a lot of money because it's old. Um, I saw a lot of those and other kinds of things. So it's all very interesting and it was mostly numismatic stuff that I saw. So that was also interesting. Um, here's another, just another view of some of those records. 
And you can see on the original membership list here, the first name is Joseph Mickley, sometimes called the father of American numismatics. And under him is Arthur Coffin, whose house we just saw, where they had their first meeting. I do want to point out that, the, Phil that um, the Philadelphia, New York, and Boston groups weren't the only numismatic groups in the mid-19th century. Uh, other societies were formed in the 1860s, including in Rhode Island, Essex County, New Jersey in 1869, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, 1862, and Greater New England. Uh, it, uh, separate from the Boston Society, there was this one that took in all of the New England states, um, and this one, a uh, big name associated with that one was Sylvester Crosby, um, famed 19th century uh, American numismatist. Um, in Canada, the Numismatic Society of Montreal was formed in 1862. And a little later, in 1878, the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Society was founded, and their early records can also be found on the Newman Portal. Uh, this group still exists today, and Wayne Homeran of eSylum fame, I don't know if, if he's here today, uh, has written a great detailed history of it that can be found online. Uh, Europe had about a 20-year head start on the United States in this area. Uh, such societies and numismatic journals had been established in France and Belgium in the 1830s and 1840s, and the Numismatic Society of London, uh, later renamed the Royal Numismatic Society, got started in 1838, uh, 1836. In the United States, the Civil War years of the 1860s were a tenuous time for these groups. And in New York City, not only were the streets and parks taken over by troops mustering for war, rebellion against the draft policies led to violent rioting and arson directed at the city's black residents. One of the buildings that was burned on the very first day of rioting in 1863 was what was called the Colored Orphan Asylum. And three decades, decades later, the ANS would rent rooms in the Academy of Medicine building uh, that was built in the same location in Midtown Manhattan. Um, so it was a rough time, really, and particularly in New York. And as the Civil War drew to a close, the ANS uh, and others, uh, at the ANS and others, the word archaeological was added to the name, hoping it would broaden its appeal of these groups. Uh, in those days, Coins were naturally lumped together with other collectibles, antiquities, minerals, zoological specimens. I mean, suppose, I guess this is true today in some catalogs. Uh, antiquities, minerals, zoological specimens, and other curious objects. In catalogs like these, along with coins, you could bid on American Indian relics, bird skins, eggs, uh, guns, shells, and things like ancient mummified crocodiles and this sort of thing. Uh, the ANS didn't have much success when it came to areas outside of numismatics. And by the 1870s, its non-numismatic holdings were partially described as, quote, a crooked stick, a small birch canoe, a piece of shell dug from City Hall Park, a tile from the house of Benedict Arnold, an old brick from Sleepy Hollow Church, and a scrapbook containing a few characters, caricatures along with a few minerals. So really nothing too exciting there when it came to this, um, their archaeological collections. Some decent artifacts did dribble in, uh, Greek lamps, a Phoenician vase, Native American flint tools, but overall there was a lack of enthusiasm in this area. And one ANS president at the time referred to these archeological holdings as, quote, an unsightly mess. Uh, eventually archeology span curators were appointed, all of them uh, uniformly reporting on the dismal state of the holdings, basically, and all the problems that they would have in that area. So, Finally, in 1907, Huntington admitted that the ANS had never really been an archaeological society at all, and the word was removed from the society's name. The ANS Constitution of 1864 stated that one mission of the society was to popularize the science of numismatology. The Philadelphia and Boston groups used similar terminology, and this gets into an area that I find interesting, this kind of idea of these two broadly defined and overlapping groups, the hobbyist collector and the scientific scholar. Now, clearly, many in what you might call a collector category have expertise on par and surpassing what you might call, want to call scholars or academics. But on the other hand, right from the beginning, people like Gro and Augustus Sage and Joseph Levick uh, were simply attracted to the pure fun, really, of collecting things like tokens and cents. Nevertheless, those wanting to emphasize the scholarly aspects 
uh, have sometimes been a bit defensive about this. And in 1866, the president, Frank Norton, wrote about, quote, the mistaken idea that the study of numismatics is a pastime, going on to say, I have no hesitation in defining it as a science. And 100 years later, Elvira Klein Stefanelli of the Smithsonian Institution used almost those exact words in the opening of her book on numismatic bibliography. And she really goes into uh, this topic quite extensively in her other book, the Numismatics and Ancient Science uh, from 1965, uh, this, this idea of numismatics as a science. Huntington was pretty clear on which side he stood. Uh, in his first address to the society in 1906, he stated that the ANS would no longer be simply a society of collecting enthusiasts, but one of education, saying, quote, what we have in mind is a scientific body. The society's collections and memberships grew steadily throughout the 19th century, and at the conclusion of the Civil War, it built up a cabinet of a couple of thousand coins, some paper money, stamps, a handful of antiquities and minerals, and a library of about 100 items. 500 items, sorry. By 1875, there were about 100 regular members, with about 43 residing in the immediate New York City area. By 1907, membership would grow to about 315 total members. The collections would grow too, but throughout the early decades, there was continuous dissatisfaction with the quality of the collections. In 1879, the society's president, Charles Anton, suggested that if this had been a member's own private collection, they'd be embarrassed to show it. But in 1902, a different president could find room for optimism. While in the past there had been, quote, a sad lo lot of rubbish, and that's a direct quote, said Andrew Zabriskie. Recent additions have greatly improved the cabinet. For one thing, Huntington and others contributed to special funds that allowed more coin purchases. But there were other major donations in the post-Huntington years, such as a gift from Daniel Parrish of his eclectic collection of about 3,500 coins and medals, and later ANS treasurer John Riley's collection of over 26,000 coins and books of East Asia. For most of the 19th century, new members paid an initiation fee of $5 and then an annual fee of $5. And this was raised in 1895 to $10 for both. So I tried to find a good representation of what these amounts might mean at the time. And the best I could come up with was from the Sears catalog from 1897, where basically $5 could get your son this fine suit, or for $10, you could get your baby this fancy carriage. So that's kind of a comparison of these dues amounts. Anyway, the majority of members didn't pay at all. Uh, only resident members, Manhattanites, and those who lived close by and could attend meetings and use the collections paid. What were called corresponding members paid nothing at all. Over time, this caused all kinds of friction and led to a revamping of the system after the turn of the century. The ANS made an effort to keep members involved, having open hours when collections could be used and hosting non-business meetings where papers were presented. Though there's constantly complaining in the proceedings about attendance at these meetings and the meager number of papers. One problem was that the society was constantly on the move, renting rooms for meetings and for storing the collections. Some were agreeable, like the upper floors of this Academy of Medicine building, fondly remembered by President Andrew Zabriskie as a pleasant sky parlor, he called it. On the flip side, the lower Broadway location on the right was described as loud, dangerous, and unsafe. In 1866, the ANS launched what's been called the first numismatic journal in the United States. At first more popular than scientific, this became a place where the new numismatic societies could report on their activities and keep up with other groups and share information on collectors and collecting. There were financial problems right away though, and the society had to resort to begging, basically, uh, in its pages for journal subscribers to pay up. After only a few years, responsibility for the publication was handed over to the Boston Numismatic Society, which is interesting considering that that group had its own um, financial difficulties. Um, in, in 1908, the editorship shifted back to the ANS and the 53rd and final volume of this first series of the AJN would be uh, issued in 1920. Okay, so now I'm gonna have a closer look at the membership. It's an interesting group, but let's face it there really isn't much diversity here. Uh, not surprisingly, it was basically a bunch of white men. So by 1896, there were just two women in the regular membership, Sarah Bone Wood, wife of a very active member, Isaac Wood, and Rachel Barrington. And I wish I could tell you more about these women, but I really haven't found too much. Uh, Sarah Wood became a life member in 1878 and was the ANS's first female member. 
uh, this is a fact that I've never seen really referenced anywhere else. Nobody makes reference to this at the time. Oh, look, we have a woman member. You know, you never see any, I've never seen any kind of commentary like that in the early records. Uh, Rachel Barrington is also a bit of a mystery. She became a life member in 1884, and when she, 40 years later, she passed away, and the ANS received an eclectic assortment of about 500 pieces from her estate. Uh, so maybe there's people out there that know more about these two women, because I couldn't find too much. Um, and also she left not only, you know, part of this was uh, about 500 things, I think, maybe 260 French medals, and uh, about $1,000 donation too, which is nice. Okay, one research that can help our understanding, one, one resource that can help our understanding of the membership are these questionnaires that were sent out by the ANS historiographer to members in the 1890s. And these were mostly used for writing obituaries, frankly. The historiographer position at the ANS was created in 1884. And these questionnaires are extremely interesting and filled with lots of great information. And frankly, as an archivist, I would have been happy if they had continued to give these out over the last hundred years. But um, unfortunately, President Zabriskie and the executive committee disagreed with this. And you can see here in this letter sent to the historiographer in 1897 saying that they should cease sending these out immediately as they were annoying to many members and decidedly ineffectual in most cases. Um, we're not a genealogical society, it says here, we should never have undertaken this thing. So when I see this, I just shake my head because I wish they had just kept filling these out for years. Uh, by the way, when I examined the records at the Philadelphia Numismatic Society, I found that nearly identical circulars had been sent to the members there, suggesting, I don't know, a collaboration. Did they use the same printer, buy the forms from the same people? I'm not sure what's going on there, but at least a sharing of information, perhaps. The example on the left, by the way, is for Emmanuel Joseph Etinelli, famous for publishing the first uh, bibliography of numismatic catalogs in 1876. So it kind of gives you a sense of kind of big names that you might find in these documents. This one appears to have been filled out by his wife because it notes his death here in 1895. There are about 81 completed questionnaires and so they represent about a third of the roughly 240 member total in the 1890s. Uh, 40 of the respondents had been born in 1842 or before, making them at least Sage's age, the year the society started. So you can think of it as being evenly split into first and second generations in a way. About half report some college with five going to Harvard, five to Columbia, three to Yale, along with a number of other schools. Among those who filled out the forms, there are 12 lawyers, four engineers, three doctors, three clergy, five merchants, two pharmacists, a dentist, brigadier general, one fireworks manufacturer, a painter, a stonecutter, bankers, and a couple of medical book and, public, and music publishers. In the 19th century, antiquarian historical and coin collecting groups were generally a northern phenomenon. And so it's interesting to see that three members reported having served on the southern side during the Civil War, Foster Eli, Eli Horace Hayden, and coin dealer George Massimore, who wrote a book on Confederate currency. 18 questionnaire respondents identified themselves as foreign born. And this isn't too surprising since more than a quarter of the ANS's 86 corresponding members in 1896 lived in other countries. Anthony Fund here is one particularly interesting case. He, he wrote that he had been arrested as the leader of the revolution at Baden, Germany in 1848, the year of revolution in, in Germany and a lot of revolutionary uh, Germans uh, came and fled and were forced to leave and uh, ended up in the United States. And um, he is one of them and he ended up here and he became an architect. A handful of respondents identified themselves as having archaeological interests, including true archaeologists like Max Richter and Henry de Morgan, both antiquities dealers who also conducted excavations for museums and governments and private clients. But there were other people like Francis Doughty, a detective story novelist whose book Evidences of Man in the Drift was mocked for containing theories based on his having detected faces and animals and various colors and simple rocks. And he attributed this to uh, the work of humans. These questionnaires are sometimes just interesting to look at. This respondent apparently had stamps made featuring his own face and he could affix these to various documents. So here's kind of a close up of that. Sometimes when we look through these old records, it's just a good reminder of how different those times were. This member had 14 children 
something you really don't see too often today. And you can see here on the left, seven living, seven dead, which kind of gets to the next point here. This respondent listed five children. And sadly, it says on the bottom here, all of the above named children have died, which is kind of a grim reminder, right? Uh, so even during these precarious times that um, things were a lot uh, you know, worse, let's say, back then. But it wasn't their offspring that were given the most attention here. It was their ancestors. Something that surprised me about these questionnaires is what wasn't asked. There are no questions about collecting or scholarly interests. Instead, much of the focus is on family history and ancestry. And the respondents were more than happy to oblige here, like this one who drew a family tree. Others crammed the pages with genealogical information. Some actually attached extra pages to detail their family history. Well over a third traced their ancestors back to the 1600s. So for some guidance about what was going on here, I turned to this fairly recent book on the topic by Francois uh, Wheel, a professor of history and chancellor at the universities of Paris. He explains how the pursuit of genealogy became an obsession in the US in the 19th century and how it took on a particularly American complexion. Unlike in Europe, where it was more about aristocratic and middle-class efforts to secure status within the British Empire, in the US it had more to do with the idea of family as a stabilizing moral, social, and political unit in a rapidly urbanizing new republic. Later in the century, ideas of social Darwinism and nationalism and uh, racial superiority would be added to the mix. Anyway, genealogical uh, publishing became a big business, and uh, there was, like in numismatics, kind of an effort to be scientific about it and to go directly to the um, uh, primary sources, for example. The oldest member who filled out a questionnaire was the noted coin collector Matthew Stickney, known for being the first private collector to obtain an $1804 from the Mint. He was born in 1805 and died in 1894, just shy of his 89th birthday. The youngest to fill out a form was Charles, Charles Tatman, who was an interesting case. He became a corresponding member of the society in 1894, when he was 22. Similar to the young founders of the American Numismatic Society back in 1858, Tatman had recently helped found a new group, specifically to serve an audience he felt was being ignored by the ANS and other groups. And this was the American Numismatic Association, so frequently mixed up with the American Numismatic Society formed uh, in 1891, of which Tatman was a member, he was member number two. The number one name on the list, George Heath, had called for a national American organization saying, quote, there seems to be a universal need of some kind, of an organization, some organization of this kind, established on some broad and inexpensive basis for the benefit of the great mass of collectors, particularly, he said, quote, less advanced and beginning collectors. Clearly, Heath and the others didn't consider that the ANS would fill that role. One ANS member, W.G. Jerems, wrote in the Numismatist to say that he would be, quote, glad to join another society of less advanced collectors. Dues were purposely kept low compared to other groups, just $1 per year. And there was an emphasis on camaraderie and collection building. There were few barriers to becoming a member. This new ANA encouraged the formation of local coin clubs. Uh, during the Huntington era, era, an upstart club did emerge in New York, the New York Numismatic Club, which incidentally has met every month since January of 1909. The ANS was initially ho hostile to this, but differences were soon smoothed over and the club came to be dominated by ANS people. By 1917, Newell would proclaim that the ANS had outgrown the idea of itself as a club and that function had now been taken over by what he called, quote, its younger brother, where one could find good cheer and cozy sociability. And I think this ambition of the ANS to transcend the idea of being simply a club is a defining feature of the ANS's early years. Even in the pre-Huntington period, the society seemed to be constantly striving, lacking only the means to succeed until Huntington came along. You can see this in the launch of the AJN. The very first issue carried an editorial that was a lot like a statement of purpose. It criticized the state of numismatic and archeological publishing and offered itself as a remedy, but the ANS was financially unable to sustain it. And there were its failed efforts to raise funds to buy a suitable building. The society had always felt constrained by having to constantly be on the move and frequently blamed lack of space for its failures in the area of archeology. span And so in 1891, a building committee was formed to raise $40,000, a 
that was felt to be needed to buy a new building. And a quarter of it did come in right away, but they were unable to get anything else for that, and they had to abandon that. Efforts to solve these space problems with merging with other organizations was much discussed in the 1890s, including a big push to essentially become part of the New York Historical Society, which was very controversial and led to the resignation of President Zabriskie in 1904, right before Huntington was elected president. Another ambitious but ultimately failed project was the Society's School for Coin and Metal Designing and Die Cutting, which the ANS established in 1901 and ran jointly with the National Academy of Design. One of the instructors hired was Victor David Brenner, later designer of the Lincoln Cent. And the school petered out uh, within a few years. And the program, the problem this time wasn't money, but lack of interest. Sometime there were only two or three students. And the whole thing folded in 1905. One area that was a success and set the society apart was medals. Groups like those in Philadelphia and Boston would put out a few medals over time. The INS would ultimately issue over 60 different ones, as many as four or five in some post-Huntington years. With great support coming from yet another wealthy and passionate member, Jay Sol Sanford Saltis, whose family money came from steel. The medal program at the INS kicked off early, beginning with this one issued shortly after the assassination of President Lincoln. And there were several in this early period by Swedish sculptor and engraver Leia Elborn, as well as several by Victor David Brenner. Anyway, by way of conclusion, it would seem that the big ideas and enthusiasm were always there. And the ANS was fortunate that individuals like Huntington Newell and Saltis uh, arrived on the scene with the means and determination to implement them. So that is it. Thank you. Did the a early ANS collaborate with any of the universities that had coin collections and related research? The early ANS, I have not seen examples of this. Um, I don't think so. Uh, what, happened to the, what happened to the archaeological items the ANS had? That is an excellent question. <laughs> they did a, um, um, he, the, one of the curators was asked to prepare a report in 1912. Please make a report and list the archaeological items in the collection. And um, I have never seen this report. And um, I actually just wrote an article on this topic, the archaeology at the ANS, and kind of, kind of failed. Um, I would love to see that report. And I don't know what happened to that stuff. And they would always have these sales where they sold um, duplicates of coins and stuff. So I thought maybe I could stumble into, um, you know, they would sell things as, still, as we'd still do today, duplicates from the library and this sort of thing. So I wondered if there was a catalog out there that somebody knows about that has these, these items. I just can't even imagine. I've never seen this, but I feel like I'm gonna find, stumble onto something someday that tells me where this archeo archeological collection went. To, to what extent was the early ANS influenced by the notion that coins were documents and coin collections were part of libraries? I mean, that's a good point, you know. Um, as we see at the Bibliothèque Nationale and at Princeton and previously at Yale. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm not sure I would say that there was the, uh, I would know what the influence would be there in this early period in particular. I just wonder, for example, were there any interactions with the New York Public Library and the philanthropists who were involved there? Hmm. Your public library, very little um, in that period. It's interesting because it seems as if yeah. the founders of the INS just had a different conception from the people at those other institutions. Yeah, and they were thinking of themselves as the classicists or archaeologists rather than as librarians. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Mary, look at the title of the first article. Complain what is it complaining about coin design in the first article of the, uh, the AJN? That's for Mary. Yeah, it's just like it never ends, you know? Yeah, you see these <laughs> themes all the time uh, in these, you know, letters like, um, like I was saying this, I have an old coin that was my grandmother's, it must be worth so much money. You know, this is yeah. like a, a perennial. Perennial problems. Yeah. Is there anything in the archives suggests when a break in the relationship occurred between ANS and ANA they didn't collaborate as much. Yeah, that might be interesting. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely a. I would have to say a bit of a disconnect there. The ANS and ANA. You know, I'd love to see that bridged for sure. Um, I would have to say. I mean, I look at. I just say from a personal standpoint, I look at kind of their magazine, 
which I think is great. And uh, what they do, I think is great. And, um, but I have to say, I look at that and I think, I don't know any of these people uh, a lot of times. Um, um, although, uh, you know, Ray Williams, I know people like will show up in there, Jim Nice winners, and, you know, and the new Misfitist and this sort of thing. So um, it's always good to see people I do know there. And I've had great cooperation with their library when I've needed to and, and their curators, really. But it's, it's not uh, something that happens that often, I have to say. Andrew, when did the numismatics begin at the Smithsonian? Any connection? Well, I'd have to say I haven't seen, I mean, in that early period, I mean, um, I have not seen much in the, ar much of in the archives of the relationship with the Smithsonian in this. I can't think of it at any time, but I'm thinking in this early period, I haven't seen that relationship. Um, in the 1920s. The What's that? U.S. In the 1920s, the U.S. Mint collection was transferred to the Smithsonian. Hmm. The U.S. Oh. Mint had been collecting from right. Adam Eckfeld. Right. In the early 1800s. And then, uh, starting at that point, the ANA started making annual donations to the Smithsonian in the form of uh, developing a collection of yeah. interest to new collectors. Well, okay, I like this one from this. Am I, is this Jim Nicewinner? This is what I think. Uh, when will the book on the first 150 years of the ANS come out? It's been 12 years <laughs> late now. Um, I can't comment on that. I can say that um, personally, I have no comment, but uh, I can say that it's been very, in draft form, very useful to me. Um, current membership number of the ANS. Um, this has got to be Emma. I, yeah. I think <laughs> it's like, what, 1800? Um, it's more like 1500. 1500. Um, because we actually still had corresponding members until very recently, <laughs> so. Um, but yeah. Yeah, this whole corresponding resident. This is something everyone did, really. I mean, if you look at all these early um, historical societies, they were all set up kind of the same way, and they had this idea of resident. And I don't get this because they had this corresponding membership and right from the beginning, and they said, "Well, you don't have to pay or anything." And I don't know what you get out of it much, but they had this very. Uh, um, vague idea that you were to write in. That's all it said. You're, no, you're expected to write in every now and again or something like this. So I, I, don't, I don't see anything substantial too often being people writing in. You know, it's not like they're writing long article. I mean, is this a letter? You know, hello or whatever. I'm not sure what that was all about. I don't see too much evidence of this writing in actually. Um, what do we got? Chuck. Oh, look at this. It's quoting a page of something I've written here, right? Yes. Yes, actually, uh, I, I enjoyed today, but your article was oh, extraordinary. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, okay, the, the satisfaction in the organization's uh, restriking many old rare coins. The Philadelphia group had threatened to expose them. Oh, wait, did I write this? This doesn't sound like something I wrote. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, on page 42. I you know, I usually, uh, these things usually <laughs> pass from my mind, but... Uh, it usually takes a little longer than, you know, one month. Yeah. Boston evidently good. corresponded with Philadelphia over the dissatisfaction they had with the mint reproducing rarity. And oh, right, right. There's this uh, stance that they took against. <laughs> right. Right. And um, your words are here. I'll, I'll read it verbatim. Uh, okay. Philadelphia said that uh, they pledged their support, vowing, and now I, we quote, to use all legally profit, pro let me start over. Mm -hmm. All legally proper efforts to expose them and prevent the continuance of this wrongful and fraudulent usage. That's right. Two in the Philadelphia yeah. minutes. Yeah. Well, we all know that there's been some disdain over the mint doing this, con you know, current disdain, but I've never read that any person or organization had ever taken a stance like that back in the 1860s. And, and, and that's, that's interesting. From the I'm glad to hear you say that. Of September of 1858. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, they were sending these letters back and forth between yes. Philadelphia and Boston. And I hadn't, you know, I can't, you can never like say, I mean, maybe it was out there, but I thought this is, um, I'm not sure that this is, was a big, uh, like talked about, like you're saying at the point you're making. Yeah, I, th I think that's extraordinary what you, what you brought out here. This, yeah. That's struck. Yeah, I hope so. So uh, I'm glad to hear that.
Yeah, so, very much so. I've already forgotten it, so. <laughs> so I think somebody will remember it. Um, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Good for you. Good for you. That was, that was again, extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would like to know more about these first two women members, too. This is another thing I just find extraordinary. I don't understand why you get this, uh, oh, my, my wife's going to become a member. And, um, oh, okay, you know, it's like, and then nobody mentions, oh, we have a woman member now. And I think I'll become a member, too, you know, and it's, I just yeah. don't. It's never well, let's be very frank hard. also. I would have been one of those jerks going with money in hand to the Mint and buying up as many restrikes as I could. Mm-hmm. So I would have been one of the bad guys, obviously, but right. uh, here you had some of the good guys thinking this is a terrible thing to do. Okay, Grolier may have influenced the pairing with books and coins. A and S, yeah, okay. Yeah, collaboration, yeah, it's always good. From hey, Joanne. Uh, oh, hello, Joanne. Rachel, Rachel Barrington, the early member, and, yeah. and uh, I believe she was also a donor to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Yeah, I, I did. More records on her. Yeah, there when I was there. researching her, I would find her on all these groups. She's one of the, you know, was, but it was great that 40 years later, she remembered the ANS and uh, made this donation. I would love to find out more. Anybody else? I, I went, yeah, go ahead. The okay. You said Agnes Bolden Brett was our first salaried curator or first female curator? First salary curator. First salary. Everybody, this is really the time where you get your first. If they always say the first, they always use the word janitor for um, Nelson Person, is basically his name. Um, they always talk about him as being the first to be on salary. They call him a janitor all the time. I'm not sure that's superintendent, I think. I've also seen that. It's always, uh, I think he lived at the building and took care of the building. And he was a member, he had a collection and this sort of thing. Um, and he's the first to get a salary, I believe. And they started to uh, have salaried employees at that time, librarian, curators. This all is because of Huntington. It's all because of Huntington, frankly. Um, anyone else? I, um, I was worried that I was going to be short. So then I, in the middle of it, said to myself, I'm going to be too long. So um, <laughs> no, it's sorry, I had to hurry there. I was shocked. At, uh, I thought it was going to be too short. And as Emma knows, I was con very concerned about that. Certainly was not the case. It's perfect. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I'm just going to plug next Money Talks, which will be August 22nd with Nathan Elkins. Um, he's going to be talking about the founder of the Temple of Diana as found on the coinage of Nerva. I don't know if you want to talk a little more on that, Austin, but um, it looks like it's going to be a good one. Another good one. Thank you, Thanks, David. Mark. Thank you, everyone. Hi, David. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices.